Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Tammy Bieland. I'm the founder and CEO of Rick Placeless, and I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to chat with David Heinemeyer Hansen, who is the co-founder and CTO of Basecamp. And David, I'd love uh, first, I know that many of the participants and attendees here know who you are, but if you could do just a really brief introduction, that would be great. Sure, thanks, Tammy. Uh, I'm David Heinemeyer Hansen. I've been working on Basecamp and the software development toolkit Ruby on Rails for the past 16 years or so. Um, I live in California. I'm originally from Denmark and I've been working remotely for the past 20 years. And um, I guess this is what we're gonna be talking about today, remote work. And we have our entire company remote. We have 56 people at Basecamp. They all work remote. And I wrote a book about this called Remote Office Not Required in 2013. Awesome. Great introduction. So uh, obviously there are some very good reasons that you're here chatting with us today about not just remote work, but also about building a calm and ethical workplace. And so you talked, um, you just mentioned your book remote, but also you have a couple other books as well that you've co-written um, with your co-founder. So um, the most recent one of which is, uh, I think it's the most recent, which is it doesn't have to be crazy at work, which I just reread in preparation for this conversation because it uh, it is a very impactful message on how we view work and how it doesn't have to be that same way for all of us. So we'll get into that in a little bit, but first let's dive into some of the current events that are happening right now when it comes to remote work. Um, so we're seeing many, many organizations now, thanks to COVID-19, they've adopted more remote work policies in the short term, but we're even seeing some big names announcing more long-term remote plans. Um, so examples like Twitter and Coinbase and Facebook and Shopify, I mean, those are big names. And uh, Basecamp has really um, set a standard for remote work and remote policies and remote practices. Um, and so when it comes to these big names or larger, lar very large organizations that are transitioning to a remote first or a more, re more remote friendly format, um, I'm wondering what were some of your first thoughts that came to mind uh, when you saw these companies announce their big plans? I think the main thing was just uh, finally. Um, I've been shouting about remote work for the past 20 years. I've been trying to outline all the arguments for why it makes sense. Um, but I also understand that there's just a lot of inertia, especially in big companies. When you have thousands of people turning the ship around or pointing it in a different direction is, is pretty difficult. So COVID-19 has uh, sort of forced this upon us all. And this was certainly not how I would wish things would happen. It's not what I imagined when we talked about um, the tipping point that was bound to happen. I thought that was going to happen sort of organically. Um, now it's being forced upon us, but that's a terrible state that the world is in. But if something good comes out of it, it is exactly this. It is the fact that uh, a lot of employees have been forced to work remotely. And some of them are going to consider that and go like, you know what, that's not for me. Even though I'm a, a big fan of remote work and I've been advocating that for a long time, I also fully understand that there are people who simply enjoy the office, um, particularly if they are in, in more directly social roles, either in, in customer service or in sales or some of these other things. Um, but then, of course, there's also a very large group of, of programmers and designers and writers and, and strategists and, and other people who really benefit from long stretches of uninterrupted time. And for those people, I think uh, a lot of them will realize, you know what, maybe these weren't the ideal circumstances, but I really like remote work. I would like to do this more. Um, this is what we found at Basecamp, that the majority of the people who've been at Basecamp for a long time, they don't want to go back. They don't want to go back to the commute. They don't want to go back to the office. They like working remotely. So the fact that the, we've had this pandemic that has forced everyone to work from home um, is hopefully opening it up to the people who do want to work from home, even when this is over. And that's why it's been great to see that there's a, a bunch of large companies who've taken a step forward and said, you know what? All these uh, misconceptions we have had about remote work that unless we were all sitting in front of a, a whiteboard together, none of the development magic could happen. 
was false. We just got disproven. I mean, the, the basic uh, opposition to remote work on along the lines of creativity can't happen or collaboration can't happen or product development can't happen has just been proven false. All these companies have now been working remotely for uh, three months or more, and they continue ticking. In many, in many cases, many of them are going from strength to strength. You mentioned Shopify. Um, I have a bunch of good friends over there, and, and they're doing wonderfully well, right? In fact, um, they're doing better than ever in many regards, and remote work has not hampered that at all. So I think it's, it's just been this amazing confrontation between myth and reality. Mm-hmm. A bunch of people had preconceived notions of what remote work was, or how it was going to work. And then reality, the pandemic just came in like a wrecking ball and smashed all of that. And and here we are with a bunch of people who all of a sudden have a completely new outlook on what's possible and what they feel about remote work. I really like that image that you have of the confrontation between myth and reality that um, really captures it beautifully. Because we have, we've, we've accelerated a mindset shift years, light years beyond where we thought we would be in 2020. Um, And as you said, it, of course, the circumstances that brought about that accelerated mindset shift are very unfortunate. But if we can find some sort of silver lining in there, um, when it comes to workplace happiness and satisfaction, you know, that can be seen as a good thing. And so when, um, when we're talking about these large organizations that are now shifting to allow more remote work, or even going remote first. Um, I'm wondering if you have any advice about what these companies should keep in mind as they make that adjustment. Yes. The first thing about going remote is to not try to replicate the office. You're not going to. You're going to have a bad experience. And plenty of people have already gone through that bad experience. If their work at the office was a bunch of meetings back to back, and that's now a bunch of video conferencing calls back to back, they very quickly found that they got fatigued by that in a way that they didn't when they were there in the office uh, face to face with other humans. Video calls, they're great. We're doing one right now. It, they work, but they're not the same thing. They're not the same thing as, as sitting uh, next to someone in a meeting. So when you try to replicate all the practices you had, all the collaboration approaches that you were using in the office, and you just take that and you just go like, oh, it's just the same, but now remote, you're going to have a bad time. What I've been advocating for is that the main shift that should happen when you go remote is that you go from synchronous collaboration to asynchronous collaboration, which is a lot about going from everything being a scheduled meeting at a certain time with certain participants to almost everything being in writing, that you have to transition from a a verbal style of communication to a written style of communication, because when you write things down, you, you disconnect the gears. Not everything has to line up. This is particularly important in this uh, pandemic remote situation because this pandemic is not just about working remotely. It's also about all these other things that have been put on our plates. Um, Parents who all of a sudden have their kids at home, they can't just necessarily always be available at the same time. Their day has to compromise with life. And that compromise sometimes means you can't be in a meeting at 11 a.m. because you have to take care of your kids or maybe you're doing homeschooling or maybe you're doing some of these other things. So. If you transition from synchronous work to asynchronous work, you write more things down. You write the pitches down for new ideas. You write the status updates down instead of gathering everyone. Then you allow people the flexibility to um, work together without being there necessarily at the same time. Now, that transition is, is not easy, but it's very worth doing. You will become a better writer when you do this. And if you become a better writer, you will become a clearer thinker. There's a lot of organizations who throughout history have mandated that writing needed to be a crucial part of their process. Um, Amazon famously has the six page memo that every meeting has to start with. Uh, Whoever's calling the meeting has to write a six page memo. Everyone has to sit in silence and read that before the meeting begins. Because when you write things down, it forces you to think things through. And when you think these things through, a lot of the things that would have turned into a, a meandering meeting just mm-hmm. don't. 
I think the thing just doesn't happen because you realize yourself that, oh, actually, I don't even know what I really want to talk about. Um, so it doesn't happen or it does happen. And you've crystallized something that might have been a meandering one hour meeting into something that can be read in five minutes. And then sometimes the conclusion to those five minutes is great. Let's do it. No further action required. You've just saved an hour of everyone's time by, by doing that. And furthermore, this is the way you create these long stretches of uninterrupted time. The worst thing that happens to creativity and productivity in the modern workplace is that we slice up the workday into these tiny little work moments. You start by having a meeting at 1030. Well, I'm showing up at the office at nine. There's only an hour and a half. What should I do? Let me just, I don't know, uh, check some emails, browse the web. I can't really get into my groove. I can't get into my flow. Then you have another meeting at, uh, at 145, right? Again, where's the space here? For you to get into the deep work it's not there and before you know it the day is over and you look back and think what did i get done today well, i guess i had three meetings and maybe they were good but i didn't make progress on my own sort of tasks and the ones that give me a lot of, of satisfaction to do and this is particularly important for um sort of creative work as we talked about again with the writing or anything that requires these long stretches of time to think to, to do the deep work. I do a lot of programming and I know I can't get into a programming groove unless I get at least two or three hours sort of hanging together. I can't do any meaningful programming on a difficult problem if I just have 45 minutes. It takes that long just to get into the zone. Um, so it's really that transition that all companies should be making, not just big companies, but all companies. Um, the dividends are just this much larger, the bigger the company. Because the bigger the company, the more the connections and the greater your amplification of what you're doing when you write it down. If you write down your ideas, all of a sudden they can be read by 10 people, 50 people, 100 people. You can't have productive meetings with 100 people, right? So a lot of information that used to be locked up into these small little groups of whoever can fit around the conference table, all of a sudden gets opened up and it gets recorded into history. This is one of these other amazing things. We've been a written company at Basecamp for 20 years. When we hire someone new, they can go back and see the history of the decisions that we made, why we made those decisions. All the time this happens. Someone new gets brought on, we'll send them a link to a write-up from 2016 when something that's relevant to the current project that they're on has been discussed. And they're like, it's like a time machine. You can go back to these meetings. You can go back to these moments and times when the decisions were being made and you can really understand the organization at a much deeper level. So for me, writing is like a, it's like a superpower. And it's funny because it's not some sort of secret, right? Like the world has been functioning on writing as a key mode of communication for thousands of years. It's just like we have to rediscover it. And this is the other thing. A lot of people thought that just because they moved to electronic communication that they were set, right? Like I'm ready for remote work because we have a chat room. No, you're not. If everything just happens in, in the chat room, whether that's Slack or some other product, you're just on this conveyor belt. And in fact, it ends up making a lot of things worse. Uh, a lot of organizations actually degrade when their communication predominantly flows through chat. So when I say writing, I'm not thinking one line at a time. This is not neither thinking one line at a time or writing one line at a time or reacting one line at a time. This is a major problem with chat driven communication is you get these knee jerk bounces. People have to be there in the room right when it happens. Otherwise, they lose their opportunity to have a say and they can't do their best thinking. This is the wonders of writing. You can give it five minutes or five hours or even until tomorrow. Right. Um, writing really helps you pierce through ASAP culture. And allow people to think about things that you write something up and, and you get an answer tomorrow for the vast majority of things. That's not just OK. It's better. You get better thinking, better decisions, better collaboration. And then when it truly is an emergency, OK, sure, use the chat room for that when things are on fire. We've been using the chat room at Basecamp a fair bit over the last two weeks, uh, given our launch with Hey, because we needed to make a bunch of uh, decisions and reactions within minutes. Chat is wonderful for that, right? But you know what? We spent two years developing this new Hey email service. And in those two years, we didn't use the chat room that much. The vast majority of all the work happened in writing asynchronously. 
that's where all companies really should uh, have a close look and see if, if they can't level up through that. Yeah. Now, I love your perspective on writing being that superpower. And that's something that you said at Remote Aid earlier this year as well. Um, I'm wondering, there, there's so many benefits, right? There's benefits to the individual. They get to process their thoughts. They get to actually you know, um, give themselves time to really respond to issues. Um, and it helps the organization because it contributes to that documentation of institutional knowledge. It helps brand new hires because you get visibility, you get transparency into all of that. And I'm, I'm wondering as an individual contributor, because many of the people that are on today's event, they're looking for jobs, they're might, they're maybe looking for their next their next role or their next business that they're working with. And I'm curious about any tips that you have for those individual contributors to number one, develop those writing skills, and also two, how can they help their managers, their supervisors, and additional, and their colleagues too, to understand those keys to remote work and writing? Yeah, these are great questions. I think I can just tell you how I've done it. I get better at writing when I write. I get better at writing when I read. It's it sounds glib, but it, in some ways it is that simple that you need to, to read a lot and write a lot. And I've taken a lot of uh, sort of inspiration in my writing from all sorts of sources. There's sort of the direct sources on, on things like On Writing Well, which is a wonderful book by, I think, uh, Zimmerman is the author. Mm -hmm. author and um, um, Strunk and White, uh, Style Guides, and, and other things of just sort of the craft of the word and the sentence. But then it's also other things like reading literature, reading sort of historic documents, reading a, a very broad section of humanity, because this is really how humanity uh, transports ideas through time. The fact that um, Stoicism, for example, which is something I've been diving into over the past uh, uh, five, seven years, we have writing that's 3,000 years old that will teach you so much, not just about life and ideas, but about writing itself. There's a wonderful book called the manual by Epictetus that's like 70 pages long. Each chapter is super short. You can read the entire book in 45 minutes. It is one of the best pieces of writing that I've ever seen. The highest um, sort of number of ideas per sentence almost, not even per page. And I look at something like that and I go like, wow, I want to write like that. I want to write the ideas, the pitches and all the other stuff at Basecamp just like that, right? I want to have that succinctness to it. So I think just really a broad reading um, curriculum is, is really helpful. And it's not just about, don't just read like business books that were published in the last five years. Your writing is going to take on an unfortunate uh, perspective if that's what you do. The best writing has stood the test of time. So when you can find a book that's been around for 3,000 or not quite for 3,000 years, uh, two and a half thousand years or something like that with Epictetus, you know, it's probably pretty good, right? And it, you need the whole spectrum. You need all of that. And then the, the second part is, is you got to write. You also got to practice, right? This is, I mean, we've never had more opportunities to publish than we do today. If you work in a technical role, you can write up the things you learn. People always love reading uh, others going through the same experience that they're in, whether you're picking up a piece of technology or you're learning something about it, you can write it up. You can help others through writing. Stack Overflow and other platforms allow you to simply go in, someone poses a problem, and you write uh, the best answer that you can. There's so many opportunities to, to practice that. And if you're currently out of work, this is a great way to spend, if not eight hours out of your day, at least four, um, spend them on writing, hone that. And I say that not just because like it's a great skill to have. I think you're going to level up your life simply doing that. Writing is never going to go out of style. So these are investments you're going to make that are going to pay off for decades, um, if not the rest of your life. And just speaking at uh, from my, my own role as someone who hires people at Basecamp, this is the first thing we look at. At Basecamp, um, you submit your CV and your cover letter, and we don't even look at your CV until we've been captured by your cover letter. Now, I know not all organizations work like that, and some of them just put it in a big, into a big database, and then they do keyword searches on, like, you've got to use this technology for seven years, and that's how they fill their candidates. But I think there's a growing number of companies who do look at sort of a more human, broader perspective of someone. And the best way to communicate that is through the cover letter. So writing stuff like that, um, finding the right tone, I think, is, is 
also really important. Um, we receive whenever we do openings, we often receive over a thousand applications. So we read a lot of these things. And one of the things that speaks to a hiring person is someone who kind of gets what the company is about, right? At Basecamp, we have a very informal tone. So when someone writes, dear hiring manager, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of courteous and, and it's fine, but it does perhaps reflect that someone didn't sort of study the style or the tone of the organization. And it's just easier to connect with someone who's sitting there and, and reviewing applications if you know what the, the company style is. And just the same, you apply to perhaps a more traditional company and then you don't go like, hey, right? Like you, you try to fit to it and, and you, you try to practice it. And, um, and again, I think it, it's one of those things like where even the practice itself has value. If, yeah. if you write on Stack Overflow, if, if you write technical stuff, or if you're not in a technical role, you write about the things that you learn, even if there's no one else listening, and usually there always is, the internet is a very large place, and there's always someone listening, even if it's just five people, you're going to learn something from that. You're going to get better. I look back, I've been writing on the internet for the past 25 years. I look back at some of my early writings, and I'm like, yeah, I got better. <laughs> and I got better because I kept writing. Yeah. Very, very actionable tips there. And I hope that people are taking notes. Um, I especially love that tip about learning about the brand. Um, and for companies, that especially that have a very public and visible and transparent employer brand, that's definitely something that a job seeker should be looking into is really studying the voice um, and and the, not just of the of the company and the brand, but also the people that work there. Um, and so that's a really great tip. I'd like to transition a little bit to uh, a common ethical workplace, and it it does have a. a a lot to do actually with writing and focusing on on deep work and time. One of the things that really struck me the most in your book, um, well, actually, it, both in rework and in it doesn't have to be crazy at work, but the idea of meetings being a last resort, and also the concept of the responsibility of the employer and the responsibility of leadership to protect their employees' time, and that's one of the the key components of creating a calm and ethical workplace. And I, I absolutely think that most organizations do not follow that. They do not view their employees' time as something to be protected. So I'm, I'm curious though about individual contributors and people who don't necessarily have decision-making power over how they spend their time. If they're required to be in meetings all day, what would you say should be like the first thing that an individual contributor could do to try to switch the the culture of their organization to one that really respects their time? It's not easy. And the further down the hierarchy you are, the harder it is. Uh, a lot of these changes are most impactful when they come from the top, but they don't have to come from the very top. Oftentimes, especially at large companies, individual teams have their own culture. And they can set their own approach and you have way more pull trying to get your team lead to work in a different way. Now, they may have all sorts of organizational pressures that kind of encourages a certain frantic style of working, which is, is true in a lot of companies. But you can help sort of create that bubble and you can help set the example you want to be. Don't call the meetings that could have been a write up. Don't. Do your own work in that way, right? Like set a positive example. And perhaps when you do so, and your idea is not something you just present at a meeting. No, you write it up. You publish that piece of writing. Others might go like, you know what? This was really nice. I got a chance to just read the idea, understand it, respond to it on my own time. Perhaps we should do more of this. So be the change you want to see, but also accept your limitations. You're not going to judo the whole organization in like two weeks, right? Organizations just have inertia. Um, focus on first yourself, then perhaps recruit a, um, a partner, if not crime, then in writing, um, who, who will do the same. All of a sudden, there's not just one of you, there's two of you. This is how all change starts. It starts from one little pebble and then it keeps rolling. And all of a sudden, there's two out of, a, I don't know, a team of six. The other four might go like, you know what, this is better. We should just all work like this. So let's start by, for example, not doing our Monday morning stand Right? This is a thing development organizations very often do. They do these stand-up meetings where you go around and then you talk about what you've done. Let's convert that to writing instead and let's do that. And we could just do it within our team, right? If you show success with that within your, your team, this is how the seed is planted. And all of a sudden you're the team who have this 
history of your um, uh, write-ups and your discussions and others can see that, it's going to spread, right? Um, other teams are going to go like, you know what, maybe we should try that. It, it kind of, it's not so silly, right? And again, it's not a binary thing. You don't necessarily go from a day full of meetings to no meetings in, in a week or a month or perhaps even a year, depending on the organization. But if you can simply go from like, oh, it's common for me to have five meetings a day to all of a sudden, maybe I only have one or two, you've made tremendous progress. And this is the other thing. You unlock all this creative energy by treating meetings as the last resort. That's going to show. Now, you're not just the only, you're the uh, personal contributor who's just getting more stuff done because that's the other consequence here, right? When you have more time to do the deep work, you do the deep work and the deep work shifts. And everyone goes like, you know what? That person, like, they, they really got it going, right? You spread that to, to your pair, you spread that to your team, and all of a sudden your team is punching uh, way above its, its weight class in productivity, and people are going to take note. Like, we can talk about this stuff and we can say, oh, please, can I do it? Um, sometimes that works, and especially if you can point to things like, hey, maybe you want to read this book. You slip. It doesn't have to be crazy at work under your, your boss's desk, and, and perhaps that, that works. But an even more effective way of doing it is simply to demonstrate the power of this kind of uh, process of writing as the super um, as the super skill, right? You get those things in place, you demonstrate the value, you ship the results, and people are going to take notice. I guarantee it. Yeah, oh, great points. So I have one more question for you before we invite questions from our viewers, um, but and that's about building a calm and ethical workplace during a pandemic. Um, but then on top of that, you also have this huge launch that has happened with Hay. And so I'm curious about, um, you know, in writing, uh, how, you know, uh, in writing about building a common ethical workplace, and also, as the pandemic happened, I'm wondering how you how you helped your team stay calm, when we were all dealing with trying to work during a pandemic. It's not easy. And that's the first thing to simply accept it's not easy. This pandemic is hard on everyone. It's harder on uh, some or it's more hard for some than it is for others, but it's hard on everyone. And to accept that upfront and simply acknowledge that is, is step number one, right? Step number two is once we've made that acceptance that this is difficult, this is hard. Um, the thing we did right away was to accept that like, you know what? We can't have the same level of ambition. We cannot ship the same things. We can't ask the same things from our, our team just as this is kicking off and we're all trying to find how are we gonna work? All of a sudden the kids have to be home. I gotta figure out homeschooling. I gotta figure out all these things. Of course, the support network kind of just dissolves if you have grandparents helping out, like all of a sudden they can't do that. Um, it's a new and difficult situation. You might have multiple, uh, um, uh, your spouse might be working from home as well. All of a sudden, you're sharing the space that used to be yours for remote work um really hard right so we were going to launch hey in april that was our original plan we had broadcast that deadline for two months or something we've been sort of hyping it up and we'd be like hey we're really excited to get this out there and then the pandemic hit and we went we can't do this i mean technically we can do it but maybe but we're gonna kill ourselves, right? Is now the time where we should be at this peak level of stress, um, especially now knowing what the actual launch was. I can't even imagine going through <laughs> how stressful this has been if it was right when the pandemic kicked off. So we took the hard decision and say, we can't do it. We gotta postpone. We gotta even see where this is going. Um, in the first weeks of the pandemic, uh, we were just all focused on like, how can we do this safely? How can we make sure that our employees are safe? And I mean, I went on Twitter trying to agitate for other employees to be safe too. Essentially, uh, getting other companies to go with the remote work, don't get people into the office. We knew quite early on that getting into the office and sharing the same uh, airspace was one of the worst things you could do in a pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. So we pulled back and said, um, we just don't even know. When, when, when this was, we canceled the launch, 
and said, we're not going to launch in April as we originally intended. We were going to have actually our whole company meet up uh, in April so we could celebrate the launch in person together. And of course, that was out the window. We weren't going to ask 56 people to fly. We weren't going to ask them all to gather in a, uh, in a room together to do any of these things. So we accepted the fact that we couldn't do that. We accepted the fact that we had to pare back our ambition. And then we just pushed it out. We postponed it. We didn't even put a new date on it. And then we regrouped and we said, you know what? First of all, we kicked this whole thing off just as, as it was going sort of the wildest and we were at the peak of the uncertainty. Do you know what? Take Friday and Monday off. Take a long weekend to get ready, right? At this time, this was, um, when was this? Late March or something? Um, where we're like, we don't even know, are there going to be food shortages? There was all these pictures from like uh, grocery stores and so on without the goods. Like, we need our employees to take care of their families, take care of their situation first. Um, and then we're going to worry about work later. And even so, here we have, again, we had a product we've been working on for two years. We were ready to go. And then it, it just couldn't happen. And you just sometimes, you just got to accept that, right? You can have all the best plans in the world. In fact, I just went through another example of having all the best plans in the world, thinking you had it figured out, and then reality hits, right? Like no one plans for a pandemic and no one plans for a trillion dollar company to shake you down. These are things that just sort of are. And uh, you can either try to deny that and think like, no, we just, we're going to push through and like, hey, we were already a remote company, right? You could say like, well, Basecamp is already a remote company. They know how to do all this stuff. Like what is the, how is a pandemic even an interruption? Um, <laughs> again, I keep coming back to the, the kids thing, just because I have three, <laughs> we have three in our household. It's not the same thing. If you're used to your kids going to, to daycares, institutions, all of a sudden having them at home um, is a very different situation. So um, we accepted that. We accepted reality and we pushed it back. And it wasn't until uh, then more than a month later where we felt like we had the lay of the land. People had gotten into new routines. They had figured out how work could um, coexist with this different new life. And we kind of got ready and like, okay, we're sort of, we're, we're back to knowing at least what we got and we will work with what we have and we will set a new plan. And then we ended up um, uh, releasing, uh, uh, releasing Hey uh, last week. Yeah, awesome. And congratulations, by the way, I've been following the release and it sounds like it's been a huge success, uh, not without some, you know, some things that are contributing to probably your stress right now, right? Um, but I, I am very thankful for for what you just said. Um, it makes it reminds me of a chapter of, of your latest book where you uh, it's titled "Curb Your um, Curb Your Ambition," right? And that is exactly yes. what you mentioned. Um, and so, if anybody wants to, uh, a little bit more on on that concept, please check out. Uh, it doesn't have to be crazy at work. So I'd like to um, go now to the chat to ask some questions from the audience before we close out. Um, let's see, what have we got here? Go to the end. Um, do you believe that transitioning towards a remote environment is causing companies to hire less junior level roles? This is one of those questions I get a lot where like you can't train people when you're remote. And like, I'm sorry, no, you're wrong. You totally can. And we've been doing it for 20 years. And in fact, in many ways, it's easier. Again, we talked a lot about this written culture. It is so much easier for people to onboard in a company that has a written culture because they don't have to ask everything. They can look things up themselves. They can be self-sufficient way faster. We've hired a bunch of people who've gone from not even having a specific knowledge of, of our software industry in, in certain roles like uh, data analysis who've been able to simply soak up like a sponge the, the history of the company, how we've been doing things, and get up to speak much quicker. Now, it requires work still. Like, you can't just drop some, you can't drop anyone into any organization and just expect like, oh, they're going to be amazing in two weeks. No one hits the ground running. But if you do the work, you have a process, you, you have a plan for it. In my opinion, it's actually easier to do it remotely. Now, We've historically done uh, some of our onboarding remotely and some of our onboarding in person. For example, when we onboard for customer service, we have historically done it in person because it's sort of, um, there's a specific regimen of, of very close review and, and so forth that works well in person. And also just for the human factor, right? 
It's not actually about the skills so much as it is about the human connection. So when you have the opportunity to do the in-person, it's great. It's great to meet your, your coworkers. In fact, we often try to hire people sort of somewhat close to when we have our bi-yearly meeting because you get to meet everyone. And that is an important part. Like those human connections really do matter. They don't necessarily matter that much for the productivity or for learning the skills, but we have to learn each other. And I think that that is, um, that is helpful and is healthy and encourage it, but it also shouldn't be a blocker. We just hired someone who lives uh, in the northern part of, of Norway, right? In a pandemic. They weren't going to fly to Chicago. Should we not have hired them because of that? Absolutely not. Wonderful person we've hired. Um, it's, don't let it be a blocker. Let it be a level up. Try to do as much as you, as you can when it's possible. But absolutely, it's completely bunk that you can't train people, um, junior people. We've hired junior people. It can absolutely work. Yeah. Great answer. Uh, a really great question just popped up in the chat about how do we find companies that have your perspective? So do you know, like, where can you find other companies that have the same perspective that Basecamp does? Um, this is something we've, we've been trying to solve this problem. In fact, we thought for a while, maybe we'll make a job board. Um, someone did, I think it's called comp companies, maybe.com or something like that. If you search for comp companies job board, um, they kind of picked up on this word we've been using a lot, calm. But the problem is I can't vouch for any other organization, right? Like it, a lot of organizations sort of perhaps can put on a good face when, sort of on the website or in the blog or whatever, but I don't know. I, I can't audit that, right? So I've been very hesitant about making specific recommendations unless I know the people very well around those organizations. And there are a bunch of people like us. It's not like Basecamp is some unique unicorn in this way. There are a lot of companies that are starting to talk about this. And I think that this is perhaps the thing we've helped encourage a little, is that like, put it out there. Talk about what your company uh, does, how they do things, what they value. Are you an organization that um, carries this uh, asynchronous communication and writing and so forth? You can pick up a lot about how companies communicate and, and I think that um, that's probably the best way to go. Soak it in, try to look at how they communicate and, and make your best best. And then also ask people work there, right? Because that's the other thing. Like I may talk about like, oh, Basecamp is such a uh, calm, remote place. Do you know what? I could be full of shit. I mean, I'm just saying that straight up. Like I'm a, I'm a partner at the company. Of course, I'm going to say it's, it's a wonderful, nice place, right? Ask the people who actually work at Basecamp and you'll get the straight answer. Yeah. So do your research is what you're saying to individuals who yes. are job searching um, on multiple levels that will help you in the job search process. So we talked about writing cover letters, really um, crafting and customizing anything that you're putting out there to match the culture, to match the language, to match just the perspective of the company that you would like to work at. Um, and before you do that, it takes research. It takes conversations with people who work there and, and doing that work. So thanks very much for all of that advice. And so tell us, David, where can uh, people find you if they wanna learn more about your work, about Basecamp, et cetera? So our main site is basecamp.com and basecamp.com slash books is where all our books are, um, both the books that I've written and the books uh, other people at the company have written, like our software methodology shape up is linked there. Um, usually I just, um, without hesitation, recommend my Twitter feed, but um, I've been giving a um, sort of a viewer discretion warning <laughs> lately because that feed is uh, is a fire hose and um, you should know what you're in for. Maybe uh, scroll back a little bit if you want to hear me talk a lot about hay right now. It's a great mm -hmm. feed to be on. If you don't want to hear about that constantly, um, I'm not so sure whether it's a safe place to be, but that is not my main outlet um, on a sort of day-to-day -day basis is at DHH. Um, but it's a better place to start with my writing. I'm a little more calm and considered. No surprise, as we've just talked about, um, in my books, and I've written quite a few of them. And I also have my own personal website at dhh.dk, where someone can read about uh, the other things that I do. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks so much for your answers and for your time and for your expertise here. We really appreciate you spending the time with us. Well, thank you so much, Sammy. This was great. Thanks, David. And thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks.